The yoke was on Jeremiah. Okay, not funny. But imagine a prophet parading around town with a yoke around his neck. You stop and listen and soon begin to understand the yoke is now a parable that registers in your brain, as truth usually does, and calls you to action. The question then is, will you move towards truth as only the gospel shows, or stay where you are because everyone else has something that resembles what they think is truth? What yoke do you carry instead of living in the truth? I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome each one of you to our discussion today. Would you introduce yourself and why don't you tell us how you like your eggs? Uh, okay, uh, my name is Eric Sloan uh, and I like scrambled eggs, Oops. plain and simple. Hi, my name is Gina Ferranda. Um, it depends on what I'm eating, but more often than not, I do prefer them scrambled. And my name is Alex Karras and I like my eggs vegan. Oh, wonderful. Okay. <laughs> Well, I like my eggs, huevos rancheros, so that's how I prefer them. Hmm. Um, we're going to be talking about Jeremiah's yoke, as you've heard in the intro. And I ask you, would you mind uh, praying for us and giving us our uh, scripture? Of course. Um, I'm reading from Luke 9, 23. Then he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily. Hmm. And follow me. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for letting us come together today to study your word. Help us think clearly and provide some pretty good discussion to the Sabbath school lesson today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, so, you know, we heard in the intro that we're talking about Jeremiah's yoke, and as we've read through the lesson, we're, we're understanding that Jeremiah was really a, a, an integral character here mm. that was, was used by the Lord to kind of help instruct the people of that time. And he was used in a very particular way. He had to have kind of a, an actual, you know, he had to act out some of what God was wanting to display to his people. So, you know, one of the questions we could ask is, tell me about someone who illustrated a message by acting or living it out, and how did it impact you? Uh, okay, uh, I had a pastor who preached a sermon series about uh, Matthew, I don't remember what it, the exact chapter and verse, but it was talking about uh, whatever you did to the least of these, you mm -hmm. did unto me. So he, every week, did like, or acted like the least of these. One week he went homeless, one week he went without shoes. Mm -hmm. uh, and that just really brought it home for me and probably the rest of the congregation, like, uh, you know, the message he was trying to show. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for me, uh, I would have to say, it's my wife, actually. You know, in, in our home, uh, my personality is like, you know, the visionary. I have all these uh, dreams, and I, I'm able to plan ahead and, and think. But one of the things I'm pretty bad at is executing. Mm -hmm. My wife is very good at that. And so um, what I noticed from her is, uh, you know, if we tend to see something that is off in a program, whether it be a church or whether it be a project that we may be working on, we, we tend to see these things. But then I look at her, her personal life and I see whatever she puts her hands to do, she does it with all her heart, with all her might, and it's always excellent. Mm -hmm. and, and definitely it's been a big, big inspiration to me. Yes. Yeah. And I think when we see people, um, even if it's in, in a parable form or in you know, an illustration form in church mm -hmm. or even within our own homes, our households, yeah. and we see how someone lives something out, an idea, a message, a concept, it really makes it real for us. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise in that, we're kind of just stuck in the con conceptualization phase where we're just like, okay, that's a good theory, that's a good thought. But we're not really sure how that would ever 
inter how we would interact with it. I, I think this was what uh, Jesus is hinting at and saying, you are the light of the world. Mm -hmm. Basically, you know, it's our task and our duty to take what's in the Bible and everything that Jesus has said and everything that God has told us mm -hmm. and really make it a reality in the eyes of, of the people. Right. And, you know, I, I heard an interesting quote one time that many people, the only gospel they'll ever read is your life. Right. And mm -hmm. that, that really made a big wow. impact in me. Right. So let me ask you, if you went to Jeremiah 16, 1 through 13, what was God asking Jeremiah to do? Did you have that ready? Uh, yeah, so, I'm sorry, did you, say, did you yeah. say you wanted me to read it? Yeah, if you it? can read it, Jeremiah oh. 16, verses okay. 1. Okay, no, I didn't. Or, or, or in 1 through 13, you can tell us to read it. what Jeremiah <clears throat> was asked by God to do. Okay. So in Jeremiah 16, 1 through 13, uh, God kind of, he asks Jeremiah not to take a wife, not to have kids. Mm -hmm. um, and then he just kind of lists out more and more things about Israel and how that relates to not having mm -hmm. kids, not having a wife. Now, um, why was this a big deal for someone like Jeremiah in the time in the setting that he lived in. It's funny that you ask that because if you think specifically around the time that he was, I guess, existing, um, that was completely the opposite of what you were supposed to be doing. You know, be fertile and increase. That's mm -hmm. what your that was your main focus. But the command, for, yeah, for for him to to have this new, I guess, direction be thrown on him and say, don't don't take a wife, don't have kids. Sure, everything else was was. Um, could have been difficult, but that one more often than not. I mean, he was alone. He was, hmm. he was solitary, and I mean, I think that would would have been what was most difficult on him. Right, right. Yeah, you know, it's also interesting. Um, around this time, uh, not only were was everybody getting married and having kids, but they were having multiple wives, <laughs> which just even further pushes. Uh, the point that like, wow, you don't even have one, man? Like, <laughs> I've got four at home. <laughs> um, and does it beg the question that, you know, if, if you're seen as a spiritual leader and you don't have a family, a you don't have offspring, how, are, how, are, how is what you're going to say going to, how is it relevant to my situation? You know, yeah. I wonder if these are the sorts of things Jeremiah himself encountered and 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 how that manifested in his throughout his ministry did did people question his ability to give sound judgment not being relatable maybe to what they consider to be the societal norm mm -hmm. you know so some I think that question is important because um, it really helps us identify the, the 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 depth and scope scope of what Jeremiah was asked to do sure yeah, yeah. Um, when we think about the prophetic implications of being celibate. What what are those implications on a spiritual nation that seem to be prosperous? Well, you know, uh, Jeremiah, his life was used as an object lesson. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it reminds me of Hosea, which had, a, you know, a dreadful task, which was to marry a harlot and, and to really be made a fool mm -hmm. to the whole nation. Uh, but it, it made a very important point that God had to, uh, had to the, an example that God had to use to really make the point clear. Mm -hmm. And in Jeremiah's life, it's the same thing. You know, uh, everyone was saying, oh, pros prosperity, calm, peace. But when they looked at Jeremiah, they were supposed to see, well, wait a minute, this is actually what's going to happen very, very soon. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, you know, a lot of times um, the children of Israel and even us later today with Jesus's imagery, uh, the people of God are seen as like his wife, mm -hmm. you know, for, and for Jeremiah to be living out an object lesson to the Israelites about uh, what God thinks and what God is going to do, it's, uh, it's quite alarming, or it would have been quite alarming if people had realized it, you know, he's going without a wife and saying, this is, this is what God is doing. God is going to go without a wife. Right. He's going to cut you guys off mm -hmm. for a period of time. And, um, and, and when you look at so some of these implications now for this nation who is spiritually driven or so supposed to have been spiritually driven and has had been prosperous, when you look at an individual who has nothing to show for their life's work in the realms of marriage, family, and things that he would have given up. Again, that brings us to the question, how do you contextualize his, his ministry? 
how do they, how are they viewing their ministry? So when we think about Jeremiah's experience, how do we relate that to what somebody might experience today if if, if a Jeremiah was called today in this in this time? Mm -hmm. Definitely no iPhone. <laughs> right. <laughs> no yeah. social media. Nothing. And, you know, the question is, how do you stay relevant? Mm -hmm. How do you stay relevant if you're not at the status quo with, with what? Else. Right. And 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 that's kind of like the the whole concept of being called out uh, to be a peculiar people. Mm -hmm. To to be a Christian, you are supposed to be different. But what happens when what a Christian is supposed to look like then you're asked to not look like that? You know, how does that affect us in a society today? Uh, a lot of times, Christians that don't act the, the norm, even by Christian standards, the norm, mm -hmm. uh, are very ostracized. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't, you don't believe this, this, and this, and you don't do that, that, and that? Like, right. you know, <laughs> right. Uh, be gone from here, you know? This is, this is a church. Right. Uh, you know, we do things a certain way here. Uh, so Jeremiah not taking a wife and uh, not doing what God said to be fruitful and multiply, that would have been like so weird for the people to see. Mm -hmm. Like, how can you represent God? You're not even doing the first thing he told us to do. Right, right. And so then I would, I would wonder, um, this has to be one of the, the considerations when thinking about Jeremiah's yoke. So, you know, aside from the intense requirement that God placed on him with what he was to share with the people on a spiritual basis, even in his personal life, he had to, there was this burden now that he has to carry without having the family, without having what everybody else was expected to have. Uh, this is another, yet another burden that he has to continually face as he's trying to bring this message. Can, can, you, can you just think of what what sorts of, what other types of things he may have encountered personally, if that were you, if you were thinking about it? I mean, of course, intense loneliness. Mm -hmm. And I think um, it, it was a very tough job being a prophet, right. you know? Uh, you look at the prophets of old, and when you talk about success, I mean, Haggai is one of the most successful prophets, you know, if we talk about, you know, uh, results and numbers and all of that and, and the situation. But you look at some of the prophets of old, and especially in Jeremiah, they had to go through uh, tremendous experiences that were trying to the uttermost. I mean, John the Baptist lived in the, in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but that, you know, I think in and of itself brought an authenticity to their message, mm -hmm. saying, you know, we've left everything, and basically it's not, we're not in it for us. We're mm -hmm. in it for the Lord. We're in mm -hmm. it to, you know, bring glory to the Lord, and, and that's why we're here, and that's why we're living the life that we're living. Right. Uh, so, you know, that's, it, it's very interesting when you look at it that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Um, what message does God give through Jeremiah in chapter 27, verses 1 through 18? If, if you have a summary of, of that reading, what, what, would you, uh, what would you say was the message God was giving? It's, uh, the message is <laughs> you're about to be conquered in a sense, and, and your service now is going to be a hard one, mm -hmm. and that service is going to be to another country that's mm -hmm. going to come and, and take over. And this is definitely not something that they wanted to hear. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, if you put it in a spiritual sense, uh, you know, when you look at the Bible and you look at literal occurrences, like mm -hmm. let's say coming out of Egypt, and we look at that, well, how does that relate to us? Well, you know, just as they were enslaved to the Egyptians and now uh, in Romans and Paul talks about that people are enslaved to sin. Mm -hmm. And so when you bring it to our day, you know, how does that relate to us? Well, y you know, the question is, who is really your master? Right. And, 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 and Paul makes a very important point in Romans chapter 6. Your master is the one who you give your heart to and who you're providing service for. Mm -hmm. And so this wouldn't have happened in, in, uh, in this scenario. The people of uh, Judah wouldn't have, this wouldn't have happened if their hearts were just simply for and with the Lord. Mm -hmm. And that's why Jeremiah was there. He was trying to bring them back. And that's what the Lord does for us in our lives. He mm -hmm. tries to bring us back so that we are not enslaved to sin, but we're free uh, from sin. Right. You know, it takes me back to another story in the Bible about Jonah. Jonah gives like this almost exact same message to the Ninevites. People from Nineveh, they were like the worst people in the known world mm -hmm. at the time, as mm -hmm. far as like uh, there's how much sin they're committing, how many like murders, uh, all sorts of stuff. They were the worst people and uh, they changed. They heard this stuff, they're yeah. like, and they were like, whoa, you're right. Mm -hmm. And they completely changed their minds and 
God didn't destroy them. Right. God didn't Amen. let anything happen to them because they changed their ways. And it's interesting that Jeremiah gives this exact thing and to the people of God, mm -hmm. and they still can't can't turn themselves, you know, to the truth. Mm -hmm. They're so caught up in their in their worldly success that they were having at the time because they were a prosperous nation mm -hmm. at this point that they just they just couldn't see past it. Right. Yeah. And and do you think the content of the message received, um, you know, it's not just that you're going to be um, now governed by another right. country, by another ruler. It's just happens to be like the rival. So, it, you know, it's not really easy to think that, you know, God who is supposed to be protecting us, loving mm -hmm. and caring for us, delivered us out of Egypt, for us to then think he would place us under, you know, their control. And so Jeremiah now bringing them this message, what kind of denial do you have to be in <laughs> to, to, to think that you could have lived the way you've lived even after seeing the salvation and glory of God and then, you know, hearing that this is now upon you and to still turn mm -hmm. away from the guidance that God is providing. How do we end up there? How do people end up like that? How did that happen? It's very puzzling to think about. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of times I get in the habit of looking back, looking at the Israelites coming out of Egypt and God splitting the Red Sea and doing all these miracles, making sure they didn't get any diseases, diseases and uh, making sure they were safe and protected in the desert. Mm -hmm. And then all the murmuring and all the rebellion and all the things that they mm -hmm. went through. And I'm like, man, how could you do that? Right. You know, you, you, God just worked so many miracles for you in your life. And then, you know, I think it's the experience with all of us here and mainly uh, most, most people in the church is that when you look at that and then you look at your life and you're like, wait a minute, who am I to say anything? Because have I really given my all to the Lord? Mm -hmm. How many miracles has God wrought in my life? And at the same time, you know, I'm, I'm rejecting him in A, B or C, you know? And so it's very interesting to think about. Yeah. I, I want to add something to that. When we're under someone's protection for a long time, uh, it's very easy for us to take that protection for granted. Mm, yeah. For example, when you live under your parents as a child, it's true. Uh, all you can think about as a teenager, at least for me, is like, man, I want to move out. I want to move out, man. Like, <laughs> I want to live my own life. Uh, and then, and then you get to the real world, like bills, taxes. There you go. Uh, Wait a food, <laughs> like, <laughs> mommy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah. And I think this is the way that uh, the Israelites felt they, from the time that they were taken out of Egypt all the way till now. They've pretty much been living under God's umbrella. Nations have risen and fallen uh, all around them. Yeah. Uh, you know, wars, they've survived countless like struggles. Mm -hmm. um, so they weren't, they, they just, they didn't have the concept. Mm -hmm. They hadn't had these kind of conflicts that other nations would have had. Um, which is why I think they, it was easy for them to brush it off. Mm -hmm. They were like, man, look, but, but history dictates yes. that this won't happen. Yes, and, mm -hmm. I, and I think that it's interesting that you brought up the analogy of living under the, the, parent, the parent household because I wonder, generations now have come out of Egypt, okay? And so did they forget? Mm -hmm. what God had done? Mm -hmm. is, was it because they hadn't seen for themselves? It. They hadn't experienced it? And what we're talking about here with, with Jeremiah's yoke, acting and living it out, seeing someone, I mean, it's about actualizing, perceiving the experience, the message, the, 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 the hearing and, and, and understanding what it is that you're supposed to do. Absent that, how do you relate to what it is that that you're called to do. So after these generations have gone and they, you know, they didn't see the split of the sea. They didn't see. Right, right, them. right. They're, these are now stories that they're hearing. Mm -hmm. How, for us today, do we even have any type of real link? I mean, are we seeing things in our lives today? Are we not even sure how to identify them yeah. about how marvelous God has been? Uh, about why we need to be called back to this personal relationship, and then if we are, what that might mean, what that yoke might look like, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, as you were saying that, it kind of, I thought of it literally. In our time, uh, here in the United States, uh, we have life very easy. Uh, even 
you know, 90% of the United States' is life far easier than most, most people in the world. And, so, and that's very similar to the way the Israel is right now. Jeremiah being that one guy, <laughs> be like, no, 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 it's going to happen. It's really going to happen. Right. And uh, with the religious leaders of the time, just kind of, no, you know, the, sh the sheeple of the time, no, please, don't listen to him. Yeah. It's going to be good. Mm -hmm. so, so now that you mention that, the question I would have is how would you react to someone who stood up in church leadership and did a similar thus saith the Lord speech? So now Jeremiah is in your church, and he's letting you know this superpower is now coming to take over your, your, your kingdom, your people. What, what's the reaction going to look like? I think it's difficult to gauge. Uh, I, I, you know, it all depends where the person's heart is. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I would like to think that for me, if I heard that, I'm going to be in the Bible, I'm going to be searching all this for myself, and I'm going to be on board with what he's saying. Uh, but, you know, how would I react if it's not something I, I want to hear? Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's the, you know, experience that a lot of Christians fall into. You know, how are we when it's things... Like if, if a preacher is, is rebuking on, right. on the pulpit as, as, as young people or as older people, how do we take that? Mm -hmm. You know, what God wants is for us to search the scriptures for ourselves mm -hmm. to be faithful Bereans. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? We, we look at the scriptures, we compare it and see what does it mean? Is it true? Mm -hmm. And I think um, what it all amounts to is where are, where's our heart? It's that personal relationship with Jesus. You know, if, if you're allowing God to mold you day by day and humble you and, and, and mold your heart, you know, no matter what it is that you may be off, you're going to humbly say, okay, Lord, you know what? I'm off, you know, right. and I'm thankful that you died on the cross for me that I don't have to die right now. You know, right. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this uh, rebuke and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to come to you and I'm going to ask you to fix it for me. Mm -hmm. I think it, it will be difficult at one point, um, especially like what he was saying, if it's something that we don't want to hear. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I agree with what he's saying that, yeah, it depends on where you are, what you've come through, the experiences that you have, and you, mm. you've acknowledged all of the things that have happened in your life and those experiences with God and that relationship that have bound you closer to him mm -hmm. so that when you hear something like that, you humble yourself, you lower yourself and mm. put himself, put him... There but, but you know what, guys, realistically speaking, and I'm just going to say realistically, sure, 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 sure. if somebody came to my church and they said, such and such a country is not going to be taking over the United States, <laughs> and this is how we're going to live, and this is how God would have it be, you know, the first thing yeah. I want to do is find out what is this person's qualifications? How do you know <laughs> that, where did you get that information from? I've seen nothing on the news in the developing world about it. I, I, I had no idea that they were coming up that, that strong up against you. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, sure. These are my questions. I want to know, um, first, what are your qualifications? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, how do I know that that specifically is a God thing? Like, did God tell you that? Or is that literally just what happened since they acquired nuclear warheads? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, those are the kinds of real questions I want to ask myself. And that's why I think Jeremiah's situation was so dire. Because what were his qualifications? Hmm. And what was his connection? You know, and in and, and, and the time frame that he's coming from, you don't, you're not prosperous. You don't have what the typical, you know, Jewish hmm. leader would have as representation of having a spiritual, uh, a deep spiritual relationship with God. You don't have that. So, you know, and where did you get your information from? This is probably most likely what he encountered. And if we had to encounter, I mean, at least he got to like demonstrate it with the yoke. You know, mm -hmm. he got to walk through the street. Would, he, would they even get that far in church service? You know, like <laughs> these are the types of real situations that we have to try to link ourselves to to figure out what would happen if that were today. How would we even, would we be even prepared to, to interact with that? Even given scripture, knowing that it's happened before, would we be in the realm of disbelief? Yeah, and I, I think uh, that's a, it's a, it's a great point that you're making. And um, I, I think the danger that, you know, young people in the church and anybody in the church is that, you know, similar to what Jeremiah did for the people, we may not be under a physical threat that maybe someone has to stand in the pulpit and say, you know, uh, this country's coming or whatever it may be. But the challenge for younger people in this younger generation is, you know, hearing things that doesn't, that they don't mesh with what, you know, we think we should do. Mm -hmm. And how do, we, how do we react to that? Because we live in a culture that is so strong. 
And um, what it does is it engulfs a lot of uh, people's minds and, and it, div um, it changes thinking and that, that is totally off of what the Bible says. Mm -hmm. And so I, what I, when I think about Jeremiah standing up and preaching and telling the people all of these things, mm -hmm. and judgment is coming basically, mm -hmm. you know, isn't that what's going on in the spir spiritual mm -hmm. sense here? Right. You know, we're called to say, well, you know, a judgment is not coming, it's here. Mm -hmm. And we need to be ready, we need to be prepared. Mm -hmm. But what does that mean? Right. Well, being prepared means this, that, and that. Right. How do we take that? Right, you know? right. Especially now, because now we're going to throw another character in here. You know, the gentleman just got up at church, right? And he's mm -hmm. telling us about the superpower that's going to take sure. over. He's got the yoke and everything. And then, <laughs> you know, next Sabbath, next gathering mm. of our of our worship ceremony someone else comes up and says hey you know what got the recent update no nuclear warheads <laughs> everything's gonna be fine we're still number one everything's on top go ahead finish potluck do, do your sabbath picnic you know yeah. who was that in jeremiah's time mm. who was that individual hananiah that was hananiah what did hananiah bring to the mix that kind of threw everything off here he gave a, a contemporary version of the prosperity gospel, basically. Mm -hmm. He was basically saying everything's uh, fine, everything's cool, you don't need to worry. In this amount of time, everything's going to be over. How do we tell the difference? Mm. How do we tell the difference? Now, we finally come to a point where we're mentally prepared to accept or hear something, but then one person's saying something we don't want to hear, one person's saying something we do want to hear. How do you prepare yourself for that? You know, um, and just real quick. Well. Do you want like my answer or the answer that I'm supposed to give? I want to uh, hear what you. you know, <laughs> I want to hear what you. Yeah. Um, well, what I th what I would probably do in this situation would sadly be to just follow Han and I. Yeah. Okay. Um, That's I'm fair. gonna admit that. I'd be like, oh, well, thank goodness. Uh, I'm going to believe you now. Uh, so it might be, you saying. would say it'd be easier I'm, to follow Hananiah? Easy, it is definitely, way. it yeah. would definitely be easier to follow Hananiah in that situation. Mm -hmm. But what I should be doing in that situation <laughs> is I should be going to the Bible, right. uh, reading through the other stories in the Bible and seeing uh, when, are, when are there other situations where something similar has happened that, and how did God carry out that? What does God say about this? Because... If someone's going to come up and say that it's God's will that something should happen, like, you know, all of his will is written right here. Thank you guys so much for joining us for this episode. And I think as we close out, we're just going to say, you know, as you go back to Scripture, as you, as you keep in mind that Scripture is the reference, I think we can say safe enough, there is guidance here for us. We don't always have to fall prey to those that may come, come after the prophet that has been sent. If you would like to contact us, please visit our website at www.sabbathschoolu.org. That's www.sabbathschool, the letter U, dot org. Remember, the goal of Bible study is information and transformation. It's for the head and for the heart. For Sabbath School U, I'm Michael Martell.